Boy, the old azaleas are bigger than they've ever been. They are looking really nice. I haven't seen them look this big the whole time we lived in this house. They usually were maybe about that big. It must be all this rain we've been getting. It's just rain day after day after day. Boy, that is cool. It has a nice smell to it. Let me go in and smell. Maybe I can get my nose bit by a bee or something. Mmm, I'll tell you. I am very impressed with our pink azalea. Well, hello again. As you can see, we're getting ready to start on our fascia board replacement project. This is the fascia board as it looks right now. I've been using a lot of paint on it to protect it, but it's finally gotten to the point where it needs to go. This is the new lumber that we'll be putting on it. I'm going to uh, let it sit here for a couple days. It'll sit for about a day. It's uh, pressure treated and uh, one by sixes. I'll have to cut it down to about, I think about five and a half because the original uh, fascia boards they put on that thing were, were not a full six inches. They trimmed them down. I don't know why. It's just the way it was when the house was built back in the 60s. So I'm going to have to trim it. And then my old buddy down the street down here, he's a carpenter. He's got plenty of, uh, he built his own house. He got plenty of tools and all that stuff. And he's got, I've got a table saw, but he has one too. And I think he's got some dado blades. I can go down, I'll take a piece of the uh, old fascia board off of there and I'll take it down and I'll show him. I said, do you think we can dado these things, run them through your, your blade? I'm sure he will. He's a good guy. His name is Bill. Good feller. If he says no, eh, I'll understand. No problem. This morning I took that wheel, that rusty wheel with that tire down to Walmart. They took it off and discarded it for me. And we now have the wheel back and I am going to take a wire brush. I'm going to use this round one. Just use it on a drill. And this heavy one right here will be going around and this, you know, down into the groove with this. And uh, we'll go ahead and see how much of that rust we can knock off right here you can see underneath there's quite a bit of it along there I don't know all right the uh, bead area the tire bead area where the seal it takes place this is the area in question on the wheel and as you can see we've got some real problems here that that is so pitted and so gone you know that I don't think I'd ever really get a good air seal there it may hold the tire while the car is sitting still but you start going down the highway with it and this whole mess is going to break loose. You're going to wind up losing a lot of air. Look at that. It's just awful. And then the back side of the wheel. It's basically the same way. This is where, this is the section of the wheel where the tire was. It sat flat down in the mud when I uh, bought the car. So they just inflated it and kept it up. None of this would have happened. Oh well. We're going to have to do some skull braining with that. The next little item up for bid here is our coil spring, of course, what we took out in the last video, part 43. Our good subscriber, Freelich 2, or Freelich 2, however you want, or Freilich 2, I'm not exactly certain how to pronounce it, sounds German to me. Anyway, he was kind enough to supply us with the specifications for the front coil springs for the 66. And it's, uh, it's in the last video down in the comment sections and this is the left spring that we just took out and according to the specs that he provided it should be 20 inches in height now to tell you the truth i don't know exactly where the measuring points are i'm going to measure from the bottom here to the center of the spring about here this part right here i don't think we need to worry about that i don't think that would be the measuring point it seems to me it would be more like in this area right here so from about, from the bottom, let's see what we got. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Let me zoom it. Let me zoom the camera in first. That way we'll be able to see the, uh, the tape, hopefully. All right, here we go. We're looking for 20 inches. All right, now that is to the center of the coil, which is 20 inches. Now I'm assuming that's, the, that's for the measuring point. I don't think it's the top of the coil. If it is the top of the coil, we'd be, oh my goodness, about, uh, what, 3 eighths, a little bit below 3 eighths, 20 and 3 eighths. Now, believe it or not, there is a difference in length. Let me clear up our camera again here. There's a difference in length between the left side coil spring and the right side coil spring. The right side coil spring is 20 and a quarter inches, and each of the springs has a different 
load bearing weight or load weight so you go to the uh, comment in part 44 look down through till you come to free lick 2 and uh, you'll see all the information all the status on this thing which was really good of him to do that so uh, I don't know I'm gonna get together with my old buddy Brendan and I've never had to measure a coil spring before, and I can't find anything that tells me exactly where to measure it. But just common sense tells me it would be from there to the center of the coil. But, you know, I've been known to be wrong before. One more thing before we take this coil spring off this little table here. You see how this end is loose and spread apart from the other? The 1967 Thunderbird has it this way on both ends, whereas this one is flat. Remember I told you about the uh, the flat end? Get it up here where we can see it better. That's the flat end I was telling you about. See it's flat all the way across. And the spring coil is tapered down as it comes around. The insulator by the way when we put the bend will go between this spring right this end of the spring and it'll go right here. I'll have to pry apart the coil a little bit to get to, get to get the insulator. The column comes all the way out to the end of the spring right here right there and it'll be sandwiched between those two coils now the other end does not have it like that the other end will be will just be sitting the coil will just be on the coil I think it's down maybe a half an inch or something like that from the end comes on around and that gives us our two insulators okay you know this whole thing brings up a, a whole new set of questions at least for me number one being if this thing is exactly the height it's supposed to be, I wonder if it can be reused. Now keep in mind you got metal fatigue in these old springs. This thing is, how old is this car? From 19, what, 44, 54, it's almost 64 years old. I think, let me see, it'll be, uh, no, it'll be uh, 34, 44, almost 54 years old. It's coming up in, in 2020. And uh, if I got that right, <laughs> my math is terrible. Anyway, it's over 50 years old coming up and, and you know metal fatigue like I said, you know I don't know is the I wish we had a place in town where they could press it down. There is a load-bearing uh, uh, Spec that he provided in the uh, uh, Freelick 2 provided in the information he gave us too. I, I wish it was a place I could take it in and have it tested One more thing before we start I have come been coming out you can see the oil in the pan down there I've been spraying all these bolts and nuts with this uh, PB uh, blaster. So I come out oh, once a day and give everything a good spray. So I don't know, maybe it'll help, maybe it won't. I don't know. But, you know, eventually, uh, the ones I really wanted to get loose were these bolts way back there. See the one on the right and the one on the left? Those are the ones I want to get out because they're the ones that fasten the upper control arm to the body of the car. The bolts come in from the other side. I want to get those nuts off there. All right, let's go. The cotter pin and the uh, the nut have been removed from the tie rod end. And we are ready to take our little fork and stick it in there and just beat on it with, on the other end with a hammer. And that'll pop that baby right down. Also, also, sorry about that. Also, the uh, this nut has been loosened up. It's nice and loose. And the uh, the link that connects the sway bar down to the bottom uh, control arm the nut and the bolt have been removed from that and that's what that thing is right there and the nut on the bottom uh, underneath here to the bottom ball joint also had a cotter pin in it that's been removed and the nut has been loosened oh about halfway down so that's where we sit right now first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hammer that thing uh, hammer that fork in there I'm gonna drop that baby down it shouldn't take but a few whacks and down she goes but of course, one of the problems you have with that, if you're not careful, if, you, if you're not careful, you just stick your fork in there, uh, you can ruin that rubber boot. That is a rubber boot right there that holds the grease in. Now, on the top and bottom ball joints here, it doesn't matter because the rubber boots are destroyed anyway. But, you know, if we can keep from hurting, you know, ruining it down here, I will. If need be, I'll buy another tie rod in. I don't care. It only goes from here back to where it screws in right there. Just a short thing. When you go get your uh, alignment done on your car, that's what they loosen right there, and then they, they spin this this thing. They loosen this, and they loosen that on both ends, and then it's threaded. 
they go this way or they go that way to make this thing go in and out depending on how they want to align the car depending on what the you know the car needs if it's too far out they'll want to pull it in and you know vice versa so let's do it see how she popped right on down no problem at all now what we have to do is the same thing to the top here and the bottom down there we'll do the bottom first I think well as you can see our lower control arm our uh, actually the uh, the lower ball joint has been removed ball joint stud has been removed from the uh, lower part of the spindle and if I take my fork and push down on it see well it's all loose it's all loose down in there now so, yeah. Now we'll do the same thing to the top and it'll probably just fall right off but I think what I better do again I don't know if I if it drops out of my hands or something and falls down hits the concrete it could booger up these threads so I think I better put some tape on them or something like that you know a little little overkill but that's okay I don't want to have to buy a brand new spindle because I boogered up the threads I wouldn't want to re-thread it I wouldn't feel safe I'll tell you what I'll go ahead and let you uh Watch me bang this one out too. By the way, the nut on the bottom of this ball joint now, this is the top of the ball joint. I loosened this one up here because I didn't feel like wrestling with it, trying to get it loose once I get the upper control arm out of the car. But the on the back, there is, a, there is a nut down, I mean a bolt down there. This is the bottom of the ball joint sticking through. It has a cotter pin and a nut. I've got them both out. Okay, we've got the bottom loose. Let's see if we can get this top loose. And that's all she wrote. She's loose as a goose. Well, she's out. Nothing to it. I just pushed down on this with my foot on, you know, over here where the strut is and just pushed it on down and it pulled the nut out of the top or the bolt out of the top and then I was able to just lift it out of the bottom. And there it is laying on the floor. Nothing to it. Now, this uh, bottom ball joint has been changed at one time somewhat recently. And, you know, how do I know that? Well, if you look at the nut that was on top of this uh, stud right here it's pretty shiny pretty clean yeah whereas the other one is all rusted to pieces I'll show that to you here this is the one from this is the one that goes to the upper ball joint all rusted and everything also this one here on the bottom is really tight really tight can't move it around now watch what happens when I, this is not the way a ball joint is supposed to be you're not supposed to be able to take your hand and do that number. Listen. No good. That ball joint's head to lick, okay? But the one on the bottom is nice and tight. And I'll go ahead and put the nut back on. Uh, you can also tell that it's been changed because if you look right here, this is important for you guys. See that bolt right there? And there's another one over here. And I think there's another one up in the back. Let me get a, let me get the light here. Hang on. Oh man. Yeah, there's the third one in the back back there. See it? And originally, if I can get a focus here. Sorry about that. There we go. Sorry about this, guys. I'm all tangled up here in these wires. Okay, we got a bolt right there. We got another one back there. We have another one right here. Originally, if this thing, you know, goes by what most cars were like in that era, these ball joints were riveted in. And, you know, the rivet tops were knocked off with a chisel. And uh, the rivets, you know, driven out. The new ball joint was put in. It comes with bolts, bolts and nuts. And that's what they did. Uh, if you have a ball joint that's in there in a classic car of this era, uh, and they have bolts and nuts holding the ball joints in and not rivets, that tells you right there that they, that that ball joint has been replaced, and you can tell. I can tell just by it won't even budge. It moves a little bit, but not much. But it's going to be changed. I don't like that. They have never been greased. You can bet on that. Anyway, uh, that's what's going on. These are the boots. You can order these boots from Mac Auto and different places. The boots are ordered separately from the ball joint. They used to come with the boots, but not anymore. By boots, I mean rubber boots. Uh, the other, the, you originally. The boots would go down and they would clip underneath, underneath like that. And then it, when you put grease in, they would swell up. But lately they came out with this kind of boot. It's a European design, actually. It just sits down over the top like that. And it doesn't clip on or anything. 
I remember I had a German Opal one time. That's the kind of boots it had. They just went down over there like that. They they didn't clip on. They didn't have a little lip that went into a little slot or anything. So we're going to be replacing both ball joints. Now, why do they call them a ball joint? Well, you can see right there. See, it's a ball. It's a ball with a stud, and it just moves around and around. Okay, there it is. Now, you know what a ball joint is, for those of you who did not know. All right, uh, one more thing. This... Uh, this uh, link here, this uh, sway bar link, you got to take all the rubber stuff out of here and put it together on the rod down here that it came from, came off. We'll put it all back together so we know where they're at when the time comes to put them back together, okay? All right, what next? Well, I think next what we need to do is uh, go in there and get those bolts out of that uh, upper control arm get the nuts off. I'm glad I soaked all these things, by the way, in that uh, PB blaster. It really made it easy to get them all apart. And then we're going to start checking the bushings all the way in the back on the bottom. We're going to check the lower control arm bushings up in there. And uh, that's going to be about it. I may check the uh, the uh, strut bushings, which are up in there. And uh, I have new bushings for that if need be. It's not a problem. So, and then we're going to start cleaning. We're going to take everything apart and start cleaning. Hopefully I don't have to take the bottom strut out. Probably will though. Yeah, it won't be a problem. All right, I've got the uh, bolts loose to hold the upper control arm on, or the nuts loose rather. I always say bolts for nuts and nuts for bolts. <laughs> I don't know why I always do that, but I do. It's got a flat washer behind it. Okay, I'm gonna take off the other one. Now, if you, uh, find that when you try to take this thing off the entire bolt starts to spin don't worry about it go on the inside of the fender you look down along there and you'll find the head of the bolt you can put a wrench on it a box end wrench to hold it and then go ahead and come back but it's advisable to soak them like I did for a couple of days it really made a difference and I didn't have a single trouble with any of the uh, nuts at all that had to come off okay now both hands all I have to do is pull straight forward and it should remove the entire A-frame. Or I guess the upper control arm, whichever you want to call it. All right, now normally you would just sort of tap on this thing, you know, both sides and pull, and it would come right off those two studs. Unfortunately, this one does not want to cooperate, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, spray it. By the way, here's part of the bushing on that thing. Part of the bushing on the inside there. And the inside bushing is just completely, yeah, these new bushings for sure. But, you know, what we're going to do is I'm going to help myself a little bit. I'm going to take some of this wonderful PB blaster from Lowe's. <laughs> and we'll go ahead and uh, spray it. I'm just going to give it a good bath. Spray it real good and let her soak for a while. Get this pan down here so it don't drip all over my floor. Stuff does disappear pretty quick, though. It doesn't, uh, doesn't cover your concrete and stay that way forever but I'm gonna go ahead and give it a good spray and then I'm gonna go in the house and get a cup of coffee and then uh, maybe when I come out I can stick a uh, maybe a pry bar behind it or start out with a large flat tip and then a pry bar and then maybe just tap it and pull the pry bar to them toward me this is gonna be pretty heavy you now this is not something that's light so I have to kind of be careful I'll be wearing gloves see you after I've had my cup of coffee well, a good cup of coffee always makes a man think better, at least in my case. When I came back out, I took one of the nuts, I flipped it around the other way and put it back on there, maybe five or six threads, not very much. And then I took one of my sockets and I turned it around the opposite way and put it on the extension like this. You know, the, this is the other side of the socket. I just turned around the other way, and kind of gives me a flat area. And then I, I stuck it up there like so against that nut. And then I tapped on this end of the extension with a, a hammer, and uh, I didn't I didn't hit I didn't bang on it. You know I just kind of tapped it. The idea was to tap that bolt, uh, you know, all the way through to the other side. Well, guess what? It wouldn't go. Now this this uh, control arm now goes up and down a lot easier. I can do it by hand. I don't have to use the hammer to make it go up and down. But the bolt will not go all the way through. Matter of fact, it won't go at all. Well, what is going on here? I can't get this off. It won't come out. 
the bolt won't go all the way through, what could be the problem? Well, there's only one answer. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of is that the this horizontal shaft right here, let me get the light out of the way, that horizontal shaft right there where the bolts go through has to be threaded. In those holes, they're threaded. And what's happening is that, you know, the bolt goes through the fender, threads through the horizontal shaft, comes through the other side, and it's tightened up, and then a nut is placed on both sides. It's the only thing it can be. What else? So, thinking the opposite like I always do. Let me get this thing up here. Thinking opposite like I always do, what I'm going to do is go on the other side of the fender with a three-quarter inch wrench or socket and ratchet. I don't know which. I'm going to see if I can't unscrew this front bolt and see if it'll actually unscrew from that horizontal shaft. We're going to find out. Well, we've reached an impasse, I'm afraid. I went inside, checked the book to find out, uh, you know, if these uh, two studs right here were actually threaded through that horizontal control arm rod. It doesn't say anything. All it says to replace the bushings, you know, they assume you've already got it off the car. They don't, they say just remove the two nuts and the two lock washers and that's it, you know. Well, that's not it, is it? So anybody have any ideas on how to get that off? I cannot move the bolt heads from the other side. They are really tight. And uh, I've sprayed it and sprayed it. I took a 2 before with a hammer and I pressed the 2 before against this one right here. All I did was punch a hole in the bottom of the 2 before. So, that, you know, I still, I've never seen these things threaded on the inside. They always just came right off with the bolt. But I don't know. I do not know what's keeping that thing on there. It should come right off. It is movable. Like I said, I can go ahead and move the entire thing. The entire thing will move right up now by hand. But I don't know. I just can't figure it out for nothing. Let me get this stupid light out of the way. Anyway, if anybody has any brilliant ideas on what to do about this, uh, I'm all ears, okay? They're, they're, I, and I'm, I don't want to be hammering on those things, you know, with a hammer. I, I did try the nut trick again. I put the nut on again and gave it a pretty good hit. Still didn't do anything. Didn't budge either one of them. What is holding it on? The only thing it can be is threads down the center of the hole. And I... I certainly hope not. Somebody out there has worked on a Thunderbird and taken these off. So let's hear your story. Meanwhile, the sun is out. I think I can go outside and take a couple boards out of the, uh, the couple of those fascia boards out of the van, lay them on horses, and maybe get some primer paint on them. I'll tell you what, guys. In Arkansas, with the summer heat bearing down on us, it won't be long. I won't be able to come out here and do this without dying, you know. You, you get a couple hours in the morning, and that's about it. So we have to take advantage of just about every minute of every day. If you waste time, you'll pay for it later. So I've got to get the primer on this wood, if nothing else today, before the rain hits in a day or so. We, you know, we're either fighting the rain or we're fighting the heat. So until next time, if anybody's got any brilliant ideas about that horizontal shaft and that upper control arm I, I you know open up let us hear it let everybody hear it as a matter of fact there are other people who have thunderbirds that would be grateful to have that information so until next time uh, there may be one other thing i have to cover let, let, let me go in the house and i took a couple notes oh yeah it was that <laughs> don't ask me why but in the last video we covered removing the coil spring, you know, how to use a coil spring compressor and all that stuff, taking all that stuff apart, spending all that time showing you how to be safe and all that other stuff. And all some of you could do was wonder about that can of air that I used. I couldn't believe that's all you got out of that video was me using a can of air to blow some dirt out of the lower, out of the uh, lower control arm or the top of the upper control arm, you know, so I could see the spring and show it to you. I was amazed by that. You know, I'm like, all that time and energy I spent showing these folks about how to remove the spring and do all that stuff, and the only thing they found of any interest was the can of air that I used instead of firing up my air compressor. I can't figure that kind of stuff out, guys. You know, one time I, I remember I was repairing a television, and I went through all this stuff, and a train went by where I worked. And I was working the night shift. I think it was like 3 o'clock in the morning I was doing all this work. And after showing everybody all that stuff on how to do that television and how to change those caps and resistors and tell them all about it, all I got from one guy was, 
I hear a train. Are you kidding me? All that stuff and all he could come up with was, oh, I hear a train? Stop getting wrapped around the axle about minutia, okay? You know, it boils down to one of two things. I wanted to use the can of air, so what? The second thing is, it took more time to fire up the air compressor, turn it on, let the tank pump up, hook up the hose, hook up the nozzle, when all I had to do was run into my little shop, grab the can off the workbench, come out and go, Ch -ch -ch, and I was done. So it was a matter of minutes versus seconds, okay? There was one more thing a couple of our subscribers wanted to know a little bit more information about the wheel sizes on the 66 Thunderbird. Now I think these same wheel sizes apply to the 65 but not the 64. And when I say I think they apply to the 65, that basically boils down to I don't know. You'll have to check. But I do know that they apply for the 66. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and take a snapshot when I'm done, add it on to the end of this little segment, and then you can stop the video and write down whatever you want. Some of the stuff, I really don't know what it means. Uh, let me get a pen here, a pencil, point things out with. For instance, this uh, offset 1 and 3 eighths, I'm not sure what that means. Well, I don't know what it means. And then uh, clear inside diameter. This is the diameter uh, 13 to 7 16 to clear the uh, front. This is the front. Uh, they would have to clear those uh, uh, the caliper on the disc brakes. And then uh, this is back spacing, overall diameter. I don't know what they mean by uh, 4.78 inches at rim to center transition. So those are the only two things I really don't understand. So there it is. Stare at it. Do what you want.